Hey, hello everybody and welcome to another lecture in Geography 341, Weather and Society. I'm Dr. Jacques Hilgendorf and in this lecture we are going to be talking about tornadoes, which uh, as of recording this quite uh, timely because we are kind of heading into tornado season in the Midwest. So what is a tornado? Well, it basically through the glossary of meteorology is a violently rotating column of air in contact with the ground, either pendant from a cumuliform cloud or underneath a cumuliform cloud and often, but not always visible as a funnel cloud. Uh, it's from Glickman 2000, the glossary of meteorology. Now, what we're looking at here is really cool. Uh, this is the oldest known photo of a tornado that was uh, seen about 22 miles southeast of the town of Howard, South Dakota uh, on the 28th of August, 1884. So there's a few different things going on. I mean, you can see this really large funnel here kicking up tons of debris and dust we also noticed maybe a couple others starting to generate so this was uh, a pretty wicked tornado um, and the fact that they were able to capture it in 1884 is uh, pretty incredible so how do tornadoes form if you remember a couple lectures ago i said we're going to kind of lean into this uh, a little bit more intensity in this kind of a map we saw something similar to this when we were talking about our thunderstorms but we leave it like this. The Great Plains are, you know, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, that part of our country. And that acts as a highway that transports this dense polar air southward. With no southern mountain range, it also allows warm, humidified air from the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea, uniquely situated to the southeast of the plains, to proceed unimpeded towards that cold advancing air. So you've got air flowing down, air flowing up. Meanwhile, you've got air arriving from the west of Tornado Alley, this region that we'll talk about here a little bit more in depth, uh, that originates in the Rocky Mountains. This kind of dry mountain air pushes down the slopes and pushes eastward into the Great Plains uh, forming what is known as the dry line. Let's see this region right about here. So that air on the west side resembles scorched desert air uh, and often includes large areas of blowing dust. On the east side of the dry line, ample, warm, humid air exists that reminds one of our swampier coastlines. So we've got two highly different parcels of air or three really, or our warm, moist, maritime tropical air coming up from the Gulf, our cold, or our, sorry, our warm and dry uh, continental tropic coming from the desert southwest and central Mexico here, and then the cold, dry, or continental polar air coming down from the Rockies up here. When you've got weather conditions that are just right, so a strong jet stream, uh, a trough around the 500 millibar level, cold, dry air aloft, warm, moist air at low levels, and a sharp boundary between that cold, dry air and the warm, humid air at the surface, you can start to develop a storm that could produce a tornado, leading to the development of what we call supercells. Here we can see a supercell. We've seen these diagrams before. We saw them in our thunderstorm lecture and we saw them in our lightning lecture. The same type of storm produces these phenomena. So tornadoes are often spawned by large, pardon me, I'm sorry, large thunderstorms known as mesocyclones. A mesocyclone is a violent thunderstorm in which the entire storm or cell complex is rotating, which gives it kind of a predisposition to spawn tornadoes. Mesocyclonic thunderstorms are also known as supercells. So we look here, our first bullet, supercell events almost always occur near the updraft interface, typically in the rear or southwest side of the storm flank. Some of the supercells have the interface on the front of the southeast flank, but we're looking at two different things. Our rear flank downdraft, so that's RFD, this feature right here. And then we've also got a front flank downdraft. So we've talked about these downdrafts coming through 
the storm. So we've got, usually we've got these updrafts coming on this side, downdrafts coming on this side. So that rear flank downdraft is what a lot of storm chasers will look for when they're looking for this type of uh, event or something that could spawn tornadoes. So there's high predictability of occurrence of severe events once a storm is identified as a supercell, whether it's just wind or lightning or hail. These are the types of cells that do a lot of damage. So tornadoes form from thunderstorms, which contain one or more updrafts. So upward moving air, which is warm and moist. Uh, and these updrafts form these towering cumulonimbus clouds, which race upwards and cool to form ice crystals once they reach the anvil of the thunderstorm. Downdrafts of cold air, this is kind of just recap and reminder from what we talked about before, but downdrafts of cold air aloft also occur as the thunderstorm intensifies. Rising updrafts begin to rotate as the wind speed changes with direction and height in the thunderstorm. Kind of what we're looking at right now in our little graphic here. Along the surface of the earth, a horizontal rotating column of air is moved vertically to form a shaft, which rotates up through the thunderstorm. So we'll actually watch that happen right now. Notice it's being rotated up to form that vertical shaft. This area is where most tornadoes form. At some point, this uh, rotation becomes so intense that a rotating wall cloud descends from the thunderstorm, eventually forming a vortex known as a funnel. That's what we're seeing happen right now. The funnel extends downward to the ground where it is officially deemed a tornado. So if we just sum it up, we've got this horizontal wind shear that leads to the rotation on the horizontal axis. That updraft of the developing thunderstorm go, takes that horizontal and tilts it vertical into a shaft. And then uh, this causes that thunderstorm to rotate about its vertical axis. So there are really like four primary stages when we think of thunder, uh, uh, tornadoes. We've got our beginning stage. So this is when the tornado begins to rotate uh, as a, or starts as a rotating wall cloud that will evolve into a funnel. So we can see the start of that funnel in this GIF on the left here. Then we move to our early stage. So a tornado funnel develops, it might be transparent, and it extends down from the cloud to the ground. You can see this tornado starting to extend down. It takes a little bit of time here. But now, right, yeah, right at the end of the GIF, you can see that touchdown. Once we hit that mature stage, the tornado funnel reaches maximum width as well as maximum intensity and starts to shrink thereafter. So we can see uh, this really impressive funnel here. And then the decay stage, the tornado may remain stationary and take on a rope-like appearance before dissipating. So we can see the remnants of that dissipating tornado here, uh, but it is no longer touching the ground. So what are some indicators that a tornado or that conditions are right for a tornado? Well, uh, first is a greenish colored sky associated with the thunderstorm that is there, possibly caused by scattering of light by particles in the sky. Momatus clouds, which are those really chunky looking clouds. It almost looks like the cloud base is sagging down. Uh, a sudden drop in barometric pressure. Large hail of at least three quarters of an inch diameter. Strong winds exceeding 60 miles per hour. Frequent and intense lightning a rotating wall cloud or a cloud that appears to hang from the sky and the loud rumbling noise. If you hear that, you get inside and find safety. We'll talk about safety here right at the end of the video. Where do tornadoes form? Well, we can look, uh, if we look at our map that we saw earlier and we look at uh, this really cool graphic on the right here, um, looking at storm tracks uh, over a pretty extensive time period, we've got kind of two main areas. We've got what you all I'm sure have heard of, uh, find a color that'll work here, um, Tornado Alley. This region right here. This is where some of the most intense tornadoes have been uh, tracked. It's where they often generate. Um, that said though, it's not the only place. Notice this black line uh, extends much further uh, to the east and south and north 
then Tornado Alley. A lot of times you might hear another, uh, this region right here, referred to as uh, Dixie Alley. So after, you know, well, Dixie, um, D-I-X-I-E. Uh, there are other alleys, quote unquote, that are used to describe um, locations, but we have them, for example, all over Wisconsin, really all over the Midwest. Um, there are a little bit more dangerous in some places, but those types of uh, high intensity tornadoes can really form anywhere given the right conditions. We can see here, so this is uh, average number of tornadoes per year uh, in that region, you know, Tornado Alley. Um, we're looking at nine or more um, in you know, Illinois and Indiana, we're seeing you know, upwards of seven, uh, a bunch down in Florida. So they happen really all over the place. But this is, if we were to look at uh, fewer than one to nine, this is kind of our breakdown here. And here we can see storm tracks uh, or tornado tracks from 1950 to 2019. Uh, and this is using something called the Enhanced Fujita Scale, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in the video. Uh, but you can see most of them are kind of tracking in this general direction. Um, and we can see based off of the colors, uh, the intensity. So the dots are an EF1, uh, the mar or kind of, uh, we'll say pinkish magenta color maybe is our EF5. So the most intense storms. So when do tornadoes form? Well, we can see here in this map from AccuWeather, the weather website, um, tornado occur occurrence average peaks from about April to August. Um, in kind of the deep south, other than Florida, we see it usually peaking in April. As you span out, so kind of this region right here, as you span out, get to the flanks of that, we start to peak around April to May. A little bit further out than that, uh, we get into May. So, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. Slight difference there. Here is April. Here it's April to May. Here we peak usually in May. So most of Wisconsin, or a portion of Wisconsin, uh, Flanking out from there, June, July, and then in Arizona and the Northeast, July to August. Most tornadoes occur during that late spring in the month of May, but they can really occur any time of the year. Spring, summer, and fall uh, is just their preferential or more peak season. Um, as far as time goes, they typically occur in late afternoon and early evening. And the most dangerous time for formation is during those evening hours, uh, twilight, when people can't really see the storm coming like they could during the day. So here we can see just kind of a moving GIF uh, from climate.gov, kind of showing that uh, difference throughout the year, kind of spanning out from the Louisiana area, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, uh, and then spanning to cover a pretty expansive portion of the contiguous U.S., uh, peaking sometime around, we'll see it here, let's say May to June is when we would see that major peak. If we look at average times, uh, this is in reference to hours after solar noon. Uh, majority of them form uh, at least in certain areas. So for example, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, uh, and Kansas, we're looking at primary formations about six and a half to seven hours after solar noon. So getting into the evening hours, uh, where we are, uh, anywhere from five to five and a half hours after solar noon. Uh, and it kind of spans out from its epicenter, kind of in the central portion of the Eastern United States. Most occur in afternoon to early evening, but this varies Per region and it doesn't line up with the average uh, thunderstorm times either or thunderstorm intensities. So how are tornadoes classified? Well uh, we thank this gentleman here, 
Ted Vujita, Dr. Ted Vujita, uh, in 1971, developed a way of measuring the winds of a tornado. The reason that there was a link between wind speed and the damage caused by a tornado and kind of came up with six categories to determine them. Uh, the original Fujita scale, Included F0, gale, F1, weak, F2, strong, F3, severe, F4, devastating, and F5, incredible. Um, so they related this uh, damage that would occur during these storms to the fastest quarter mile wind speeds at a height, at the height of the damage structure. So trying to come up with some relationship between damage and wind speeds, because it wasn't necessarily easy to measure wind speeds within the funnel. Um, now, there's some problems with that. It is entirely subjective and based only on damage. It doesn't recognize differences in construction between brick or you know, wood or um, other types of construction. It's subject to bias. It's based on the worst damage, and it usually overestimates wind speeds. The enhanced Vegeta scale, uh, EF, that's what we saw reference to earlier, uh, was developed to have a consistent damage assessment that included damage to vegetation and damage to structures. It added expected wind speed boundaries and was formally adopted in 2007. That's the one we basically use now. Now, if you're looking in the past, obviously you'll see reference to the Vegeta scale because we didn't have the enhanced Vegeta scale at the time. So that objective comparison between damage and uh, from vegetation and structure and wind, we didn't have that. So you'll still see reference to the Vegeta scale, but we are going to uh, talk about the enhanced Vegeta scale. Um, so EF0 are weak. So there's three primary categories, EF0 and one fall into weak, two and three fall into strong, four and five fall into violent. Uh, it's determined based on the speed of the three second wind gust, uh, the fastest three second gusts, uh, and damages that can be observed. So an EF0 is a weak storm or weak tornado with wind speeds, uh, three second gusts at 65 to 85 miles per hour. You'll see tree branches broken, sign boards damaged. At an EF1, also weak, 86 to 110 miles per hour. You'll see trees snapped and windows broken. Uh, the EF2, strong, is uh, 111 to 135 miles per hour, you'll see large trees uprooted and weak structures damaged. EF3, strong, 136 to 165 miles per hour, trees leveled, cars overturned, and walls removed. EF4, violent, 166 to 200 miles per hour, frame houses are destroyed, so frame houses being, you know, kind of constructed houses, not mobile homes. Uh, and then EF5s, violent storms, wind speed gusts exceeding 200 miles per hour, car size structures moved, steel structures damaged. So uh, just kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. Now, what about what we see here in our state? How can we re relate this to something that's maybe a little bit more uh, tangible for us? So here we can look at Wisconsin tornadoes between 2020 and 2022. Uh, we can look at the number, the color is our EF, our enhanced Vegeta, zero through five. Uh, we have not had any fives. We haven't really had anything past a three. We had an EF3 uh, that struck here in 2021. Um, a good number of EF2s. We had four of them in 2021. Uh, and then you can see those kind of spread, kind of clustered here, just a little bit uh, east of us here in Eau Claire. Uh, and then in, that was actually the most that we had had uh, out of these three years that I pulled. We can see all of them peaked in June, July, and August, although we did have uh, an outbreak of December tornadoes in 2021. Uh, in 2022, a little bit different. We peaked in May and June and then had an outbreak in October. Uh, and most of that outbreak um, kind of clustered, I believe, kind of this area of the state.
If we look at the number of F0 to F1 tornadoes, uh, again, notice that they're using the Vegeta scale instead of the enhanced Vegeta scale. Um, we can kind of see a kind of a trend from 1950 to 2019. A slight rise, maybe, on the average. Here we can see uh, our F2 and greater tornadoes. Uh, kind of see a little bit of a difference here. Not you know a big peak here in the 70s and 80s. Not too many that we're seeing in more recent decades. And if we look at the deadliest tornadoes in Wisconsin, uh, the deadliest would have been one that happened up in Colfax on June 4th of 1958. 110 were injured, 19 were killed. Uh, and we can see uh, that wasn't the most, well, 19 were killed. If we look at that June 8th one in 1984, 200 were injured and Barneveld, nine were killed. Um, it kind of steps down from there. Uh, none in recent decades. We see the newest one on here would have been in 1985, uh, where there were two fatalities, 42 injured. Um, kind of the most recent one behind that one in 1984. We can see evidence of it on the landscape. Um, so we can notice our storm track, our tornado track, right here. Uh, so a series of tornadoes had ripped through the upper Midwest region of the US in the evening of June 7th, 2007. At least five different tornadoes touched down in Wisconsin, according to the Associated Press, one of which tore through the Bear Paw Resort in northern Wisconsin. Despite dropping as much as 15 centimeters of rain in some places and baseball-sized hail in others, authorities were, were reporting no deaths attributable to the storm system and only a smattering of injuries, but considerable property damage in some areas. The Enhanced Thematic Mapper Plus, EMT Plus, instrument on Landsat 7 examined the tornado damage on June 15, 2007. You can see quite clearly that tornado swath here. Uh, the natural color image that we're seeing here shows the area around Wolf River and the Bear Paw Resort, just north of the Menominee Indian Reservation. The diagonal slash across the landscape uh, from one of the tornadoes is pretty dramatic when you look at this full resolution image, which, de which discerns details as small as, uh, well, roughly 30 meters is what you get here. Uh, including roads such as Wisconsin Route 55, you see running from the north to the southeast corner. Uh, the Wolf River, which is pretty prominent for kayakers and whatnot. Um, so this wide bare swath of destruction from the tornado is very evident here where the trees have been torn down uh, and ripped up by uh, the tornado as it kind of moved through here. Uh, so some areas, those trees were flattened, um, but kind of differences in forestry management here really let us kind of see uh, just how striking that impact of that tornado was. Kind of moving into detection and forecasting. So NOAA Storm Prediction Center, or SPC, issues uh, day one, day two, and day three convective outlooks for the United States. So this is uh, the convective outlook for uh, a April 10th that we're looking at here. Uh, I pulled this right before I recorded, so I had the most recent one. Um, and we can look at severity of thunderstorms. So there's uh, one, marginal, some storms could be capable of damaging winds and severe hail. Localized tornado threat could develop. Two, slight, so the two that we're seeing right here. Increased confidence that some storms will contain damaging winds, severe hail, and or thunderstorm potential. We don't see e, uh, ENH, enhanced, moderate, or high on here, but enhanced says that highly confident that several storms will contain damaging winds, severe hail, and or tornadoes. High confidence that storms will contain it, or high confidence that an outbreak of storms will contain tornadoes, damaging winds, and severe hail. This is kind of a shorthand way to describe this. We detect tornadoes uh, primarily using Doppler radar and computer algorithms. Um, so the computer algorithms that we've developed 
call uh, analyze that Doppler radar data and display it in a way to make it easier to forecasters to identify dangerous weather. A storm with a tornado observed by radar has certain distinguishing features and forecasters are trained to recognize them. When a Doppler radar detects a large rotating updraft, as we kind of talked about earlier on, that occurs, in, that occurs inside a supercell, it's then labeled a mesocyclone. Mesocyclones usually two to six miles in diameter is much larger than the tornado that may develop within it. A hook echo, you've probably heard that term before, describes uh, a pattern in radar reflectivity imaging that looks like a hook extending from the radar echo, usually in the rear right part of the storm. Notice here this hook. Uh, a hook is often associated with a mesocyclone and indicates favorable conditions for tornado formation. The hook is caused by the rear flank downdraft and is the result of precipitation wrapping around the backside of the updraft. Dual polarization radar tech installed on the National Weather Service radars can detect the presence of random shaped and sized targets like leaves, insulation, and other debris. This gives meteorologists a high degree of confidence that a damaging tornado is on the ground and is especially helpful at night when tornadoes are difficult to see by the human eye. Uh, I invite you to look at this. It's a really cool story map. Um, you'll be learning about story maps and doing one of your story maps in your random homework assignment for this uh, module. But you can see real-time updates uh, if you go to that link for tornadoes uh, reported across the United States. So uh, past week, this was updated 27 seconds before I downloaded it, had had 36 tornadoes uh, primarily spread throughout uh, kind of the central region of the United States down into Mississippi. So we're just going to end on tornado safety, which I think is pretty necessary because they can be the cause of some pretty severe fatalities. Now, not as bad as uh, flooding for the most part, um, but tornadoes can cause, uh, in 2021, we saw 104 fatalities. Uh, if we look at the 10 year average, 49 fatalities, and the 30 year average, 71 fatalities. So um, they can be pretty devastating. If you were ever at risk, if we look at tornado terminology, a tornado watch, weather conditions could lead to the formation of severe storms and tornadoes. Be prepared, know your safe location, be ready to act quickly if a warning is issued. A tornado warning has been, says that a tornado has been spotted or indicated by weather radar meaning a tornado is occurring or expected soon. Take action, there is imminent danger to life and property. Immediately seek refuge in the safest location possible. A tornado emergency, an exceedingly rare situation with a severe threat to human life and catastrophic damage due to a confirmed violent tornado. Think EF4, EF5, or you know, EF3, 4, and 5s. Uh, take action, there is imminent danger to life and property. Seek refuge in the safest location possible. If you're at home, don't go to the top floors. That's not going to protect you. If you have no basement, move to an interior room with no windows. Quickly move to your basement if you have one uh, and bring an emergency supply kit. Exterior rooms and rooms with windows do not protect you. Uh, and no place outside is safe from a tornado. If you're on the road, if you're traveling, Get off the road, that's the best option, and get to a designated shelter, basement, or safe room. Uh, the next best option is a small windowless room or hallway on the lowest room of a sturdy building. Don't seek refuge in a vehicle outside or under an overpass. A highway overpass does not provide safety from a tornado. It's kind of a common myth. Uh, and don't seek shelter under an overpass or a tree. This puts you at greater risk of being killed or seriously injured by flying debris from the powerful tornadic winds. So finally, debunking a couple of tornado myths. Myth one, areas near rivers, lakes, and mountains are safe. No place is completely safe from tornadoes. Uh, they can occur anywhere regardless of terrain. There was one story I was reading where uh, a tornado that had occurred in Yellowstone uh, went up a mountain and over the mountain. Um, and they can happen near rivers, they can happen really anywhere. Myth two, the low pressure in a tornado causes buildings to explode as the tornado passes overhead. No, uh, violent winds and debris are slamming into that building, causing the majority of the structural damage. 
and kind of piggybacking off of that myth three open windows before a tornado approaches to equalize pressure and minimize distance no open windows actually allow those damaging winds to enter the structure retreat to a safe place instead so just a quick recap we talked about what tornadoes are how when and where they form we talked about tornadoes in wisconsin and we talked about tornado safety and debunking a few myths uh next we're moving into extreme weather phenomena so uh we'll get to a few interesting things obviously tornadoes are extreme um hurricanes are extreme but they kind of fit better with some of the previous lectures so mid-latitude cyclones and tropical cyclones for hurricanes tornadoes or uh, you know thunderstorms tornadoes and lightning all kind of fit well together they're all formed from the same process so um we'll move into a few other things even talking about you know talking about things like blizzards talking about things like derechos uh haboobs maybe a little bit more about microbursts we're going to get into some ob obscure things in the next uh series of lectures so uh look forward to it and i will see you in the next one thanks